This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, the thought, and to debate, brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic, and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel, and also by the Israel Institute. I'm Dahlia Shenlin. I'm speaking to you today from Cape Town, South Africa, which means my co-host Gilad Halpern is not with us, but it's exciting to be here and I'll just have to be enough. Every week we interview people producing research and books that make our lives more interesting, or in this case, people who make other people's lives better and then write books about it. Our guest today is Albie Sachs. He is a renowned legal scholar, a crusader against apartheid, starting already in the 1950s as a law student. He served as a justice on the first constitutional court in democratic South Africa. He has nine previous books, am I right? Including one about his rehabilitation after suffering a bomb attack due to his political activity. We'll be talking today about his latest book called We the People, Insights of an Activist Judge, published by Wits University Press in 2016. Albie Sachs, thank you for being on the show. Uh, good day to everybody. Thank you. So your book really is an interesting accounting of where South Africa is right now and the process of getting to a constitutional system that is right for the evolving, I would say, situation of democratic South Africa. How do you see things in South Africa over 20 years after the end of apartheid? Well, first of all, we've got a country, and nobody said we could get a country. People predicted a racial bloodbath that would be impossible for blacks and whites to live together as equal citizens in one country. We've got it. Uh, South Africa is not just a country with a flag and an anthem and winning some big races and international events. We are functioning as a country, and I think that's been a huge achievement. Then we've also got institutions of democracy that are working very well under stress. Our elections are free and fair and regular. We had a higher percentage vote in our municipal elections last year than the Americans had for their presidential elections. And the leading party, the ANC, lost out in a number of major metros and they accepted their defeat. So I think that's a huge accomplishment. We've got a strong judiciary, very lively press, strong civil society. So South Africa is, in that sense, it's South Africa. Having said all that, it's to say how important the Constitution is, and I'm not speaking simply with the pride of a constitutional lawyer, but just as somebody being as objective as I possibly can be uh, in circumstances where we have huge problems today, uh, many of them overwhelmingly inherited from the structured apartheid past, but also problems we've made for ourselves, problems of leadership, problems relating to integrity, problems relating even to clarity of thought, to populism, xenophobia, or all the phobias you can imagine can be found in our country today. Huge unemployment, still massive divisions between rich and poor, very much connected with race. But we have a country, we have a constitution, and we have the mechanisms for dealing with our problems. So all the problems aren't solved, but you have the tools in place. You, of course, preempted one of my next questions, which is to what extent do you think many of these problems are the legacy of apartheid, and which ones? Well, everything stems very, very deeply from apartheid, not only in the massive structured inequalities, but the complicated cultural and social configurations that emerge. They aren't eliminated. The law can move ahead very, very quickly. But patterns in people's minds of superiority, inferiority, they take much longer Unequal access to education in the past has given people who, like me, have a white skin huge advantages, not only in terms of skills, but the kind of a confidence and elan and so on, which has been denied to others. But now we've got just the part I think that excites me the most about the New South Africa is the young, mainly black, very much, uh, very strongly represented by women, people who are really absorbing what they can from the new educational system. And they are sprightly, they're alert, they're critical of my generation. What are they critical of your generation for? Well, many of them think 
we gave up too easily. We handed over too much to the whites. That's to put it very, very kind of simply. And they know that Mandela is a fantastic figure, but they're not convinced because they still see the elements of a kind of unconscious, semi-covert racial hegemony are still pronounced in this country. And they see it, for example, in the universities where the statues, the figures, the emblems, the points of reference, the details that come up in history, the teaching styles, heavily influenced by the past, they're challenging that. I find it it's a challenging challenge, a serious challenge, but challenging at the intellectual level. And I think, I hope, that our institutions are strong enough to withstand the challenge and benefit from it and to be uh, renovated by the new energies that are coming in from a new generation. Right. That's interesting. You know, you've subtitled the book Insights of an Activist Judge. I would love for you to explain what you mean by activist judge. I mean, you had uh, one of the lines in one of the essays, you said, once you were a skeptic, and I think you even said a right skeptic in the sense that you didn't originally believe it was appropriate for the court to rule on political issues, and then you changed your mind or you evolved in your thinking, what does it mean to you to have been an activist judge? What struck me very much, I happened to be in the U.S. Supreme Court when the gun control law was being debated. And I was invited by one of the judges, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and uh, I sat in and I was fascinated because now it was the conservative judges who were activists the city of uh, Washington, D.C., had decided we have far too much gun crime and we need strict measures to control the use of guns. They've got to be stored away and so on and so forth. And now the conservative judges, who are the ones who denounce judicial activism, were saying, no, 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 there's a fundamental right. It's in the Constitution to uh, the right to bear arms. So my reading is... It depends on whose side you're activist, whether you are given the label activism. <laughs> so if you are on the, the side The accusation of, of activism is itself political. It's very political. If you're on the side of power, of money, of property, then you're defensive and you don't seem to be activist at all. If you're on the side of the marginalized, the people who've been squeezed up by the society, uh, rendered invisible, that their humanity somehow doesn't equal that of the human claims of other human beings, then you're called an activist. And my generation of judges, I'm in my early 80s now, we were very influenced by the US Supreme Court in the 1950s. And they were called an activist judiciary They struck down school segregation without very powerful precedent to do so. The separate but equal doctrine had been going for decades in in the U.S., but with one mighty leap, if you like, of jurisprudential faith, they just said it's per se demeaning and degrading, although those words don't appear in the Constitution. And today it seems unthinkable that a court could have sanctioned the separate but equal in the United States. So they took that mighty leap. But they were activists in a number of other areas in relation to rights for women, in relation to voting rights. Uh, All sorts of schemes were being put in place to keep black people, poor people off the voting lists and so on. They were called the activist judges. The activist judges today now happen to be the conservative judges who are repudiating Mm -hmm. the decisions I can't think of a greater form of judicial activism than the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in Citizens United to strike down a law that was bipartisan, so it was McCain from the Republicans and Feingold from the Democrats, huge majorities in Congress, and they wanted to ensure that the way they were elected was clean and fair and balanced. Surely they should know best where the pains and where the shoe pinched there. And yet, by a majority, the court struck that down. Now, to me, that was a very, very activist court. Yes. That same court is striking down civil rights voting controls that were introduced in the 1960s, 1970s, saying that they're superfluous today. So they are the activist ones. And Justice uh, Sonia Sotomayor, who happened to be visiting Cape Town last week, mentioned the fact that in her judgments, 
which are often written in dissent, she relies heavily on precedent. So she would appear to be the more precedent-oriented judge, but the precedent of the judges in that great era of, of American jurisprudence. So it's not difficult to transfer that to looking at South Africa. In fact, on that same day that I visited the U.S. Supreme Court, I was invited to lunch. I might say, bring your own sandwiches if you want really good cuisine, but if you want conversation, it was fantastic. And the Chief Justice Roberts was, couldn't have been a, a better host. And the first question put to me was by Justice Alito, would you say, Justice Sachs, that the South African Constitutional Court is an activist constitution? And I said, yes, Justice Alito, but we have an activist constitution. Our constitutional text presupposes inequality, injustice, that we're living in an unbalanced society that has to be improved, that has to be made better for the majority of citizens. So if you're a textualist, if you're an originalist, from whatever starting point you might have, we just have to have a court that is energetically seeking principled judicial responses to the massive inequality that we still have in, in relation to issues properly brought to as a court. Yeah. And you do write about the Constitution as inherently a defensive document against social ills and the inclination of society to limit the rights of people. I'm curious then about how the, the Constitution... Now, can I correct that? Oh, yes, of course. Please. No, no, our, our, our Constitution is not a defensive document against government failure to um, uphold rights. It's a forward-looking document that presupposes transformation. In fact, it, it was an American professor, Carl Clare, from Northeastern University, who introduced the term transformative jurisprudence is required. And that's right in the, the letter of our Constitution, in our preamble, in the way our Bill of Rights is framed, in the fact that we have social and economic rights written into the Constitution. It presupposes the Constitution being a very important weapon, means, mechanism, instrument, modality for bringing about improvement and reducing inequality in our country. So, okay, that's a very important correction, a transformative outlook. And I'm curious to know also the evolution of your thinking about the Constitution in terms of how the institutions should reflect uh, the pre-existing, the previous inequalities under apartheid or not. So you talk about the consociational systems where there are protections for collective rights in constitutions, and you justify and you explain why that became inappropriate for South Africa. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. some I think it was an Argentinian law professor spoke about the central drama of every constitution. And um, I suppose the little I know about the Israeli constitution is the central drama of the constitution is it doesn't have a constitutional text, but it had to be created and given a principled foundation, a meaningful foundation. It wasn't just another law, and very creative mechanisms were used to achieve that, which I think are under debate in the country, very much so. but have, have brought about a lot of international interest. Our principal drama was between two concepts of South African South Africa as a country. One is, are we an assembly of racial groups who have to agree amongst each other as racial groups? Or are we all citizens of one country subject to the same rights and duties of citizenship, protected not by group rights because we're white or black or majority or minority, but protected by a bill of rights? And in fact, we had breakdowns, very serious breakdown in our constitution-making process, which wasn't resolved around the table. It was resolved by rolling mass action, by huge international support and great mobilization inside South Africa. Eventually, the non-racial idea of a common citizenship, people voting as individuals, as voters, as human beings, that was accepted language, cultural, religious rights are very strongly protected by our Bill of Rights, but it doesn't give groups protections in Parliament as such. Now, each country, each region has to have its own modalities. I don't wish to be drawn very much into the Israeli-Palestinian 
situation, but the very strong arguments today I'm hearing in favor of a one-state solution. But uh, whether or not that's historically, pragmatically achievable is another question. That's the question that's being asked. Maybe a two-state solution is the only way forward in your part of the world. But in our case, we had to go for a one-state solution, non-racial democracy, and I might add we included non-sexist democracy, mm. a very interesting feature of, of our constitution as, as well. Right. I will get back to, uh, maybe at the end we'll talk a little bit about your insights for our part of the world. I'd like to go back a little bit to the history of your activism and the struggle in general. You talk about the 1955 Freedom Charter. It sounds like in the book it, it almost may be a defining moment in the history of the struggle, but it also seems like there was opposition and resistance going way back even before that. How would you characterize how long it took to overthrow the system of apartheid? When did this struggle actually begin? Well, the struggle began with resistance to colonial domination, people fighting with spears against cannons, but it took on a new form in the 19th century, and there was one important African leader who went to the British Parliament and said, give us education, and we will fight you with words, and we will fight you with ideas, and not with assegais. And that was in the 1830s already. So there's a long tradition of the idea of mobilization of concepts. And I think what African leaders could call on quite strongly, very strong traditions in many of the African communities of democratic leadership by the most outstanding traditional leaders who would call together the whole community, listen, try to get consensus. And that gives us a very good foundation for democracy in, in the new South Africa, but not on an ethnicized basis, mm -hmm. but on the basis of shared citizenship. Mm -hmm. So if you had to try to guess, how long would you say, maybe in the, more, in the 20th century, when did the struggle begin in earnest and how, how much time elapsed until that constitutional court was established well, let, in free elections? Let me say, uh, I, my first political actions were in 1952. When you were a law student? I was a second-year law student. And we had our predecessors of whom we were very proud. Mm -hmm. and, and my parents have been active in the struggle. My dad is a trade union leader. My mom in the Communist Party. She was the typist for the general secretary of the Communist Party, she would say, tidy up, tidy up, Uncle Moses is coming. And Uncle Moses wasn't Moses Cohn or Moses <laughs> Kantarovich, he was Moses Kutani, an African man. So there were generations before me. Uh, and our slogan then used to be freedom in our lifetime. Mm. Freedom in our lifetime. We hoped to have quite long lifetimes, but we didn't hope the freedom would come towards the end of the lifetime. So we were thinking in long term. At that stage, Almost all of Africa on the maps was painted red for British colonies or green for French colonies with a little bit of maroon, I think, for the uh, Belgian and orange. That those, those are the cartographic conventions for colonial domination, orange for the Portuguese. One by one, African countries became independent. In a sense, the first shall be the last, the last shall be the first. South Africa was the last but it ended up benefiting from the experiences all over the continent mm. to get what I think is a very wonderful constitution, a forward-looking constitution that's held up as a model to the world. Right. Let's look at some of the other transitional mechanisms. You write very eloquently of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how it worked. And I was very struck by some of the stories and insights that you had. One of them in particular, you talk about the shame of telling the stories of people telling their stories of, I think you quote is something like lies that they told and bodies they buried. And that was their punishment, but that the shame also dissipated as people were reintegrated. This is your description in one of your essays. Were there any who did not feel shame who said, wait a second, we were protecting the system we knew. We were playing by the rules. We were doing what we thought was best for our country. How does that transition happen from people who were part of the system and the regime thinking they were doing the right thing to transitioning themselves to realizing or acknowledging that what they were doing. I was think wrong. one huge moral uh, victory in South Africa is that there's virtually nobody today who defends apartheid. That it's amazing 
suddenly you'd think even all the whites were against apartheid the way they speak. And I see that as a history because there's a shame about the very notion of separating people. The indignities that were involved, the overt racism is seen now as something totally, totally shameful. Now we have to deal with the covert racism that comes out in all sorts of indirect ways, can be very, very telling, very harmful, but also very elusive. Harder to put your finger on. Can you tell the story of one that you describe again in the book about Sergeant Benzian? Yes. Because it was very, I found it very evocative. Would you describe it in your own words? Sergeant Benzine Benzine. went to the Truth Commission to get amnesty. If he told the truth of offenses he'd committed even under the old law, the old law didn't formally allow assassination, didn't allow torture. It did allow detention without trial, a whole range of terrible things, forced removals, racism in every aspect of life. It didn't allow torture. And he acknowledged that he'd been part of a squad that used torture against captives. And one of the persons whom he had tortured was present at the hearing. Was that common? It wasn't all that common, but not completely uncommon. And the person said, tell us, Sergeant Benzine, how you put wet bags over our heads and knelt on our backs and made us feel that we were drowning. Can you just show us? And Benzine put a, it was now a dry bag, over the head of an orderly, sat down on the person, stood up, and he was crying. We all saw it on television. And he was crying. It was a mixture of defeat, of shame, of acknowledgement. And the person he tortured said, tell us, Sergeant Benzine, how can one human being do this to another human being? And I think those episodes did more to, I wouldn't say cleanse, but to open up our society than sending Benzine to jail after years of battling and lying and difficulties of getting evidence and the courts being involved nonstop with cases of that kind. I think that episode did more to help South Africa, to heal South Africa than... uh, formal punishment could have done, even if we'd got the evidence. Yeah. Do you think that this kind of truth-telling has to happen after the system of oppression is formally dismantled, or can it be part of the process of ending such a system? Uh, I don't think there's any rule about the timing. What was important in our case is it wasn't on its own seen as the vehicle for transforming the country. It went together with the vote, with democracy, with Mandela emerging as president, visible signs of change. Mm -hmm. So the people who'd suffered so much could see, okay, it wasn't for nothing. We are getting somewhere. For a number of people, it wasn't enough. But I would say for our society as a whole, because the truth-telling was part and parcel of social transformation, it had an enormously positive effect. Yeah. I can't help but think of people in Israeli society now who are trying to tell and the things that they have done that they are do not sit well in their conscience as soldiers. This is a group that is extremely marginalized in Israeli society called Breaking the Silence, and they are constantly being called traitors. Do you think that's just because the other aspects of transformation are not in place to sort of support this effort? Well, I must say there's huge international admiration for people who are willing to speak out in that way. Uh, knowing how lonely they must be repudiated by their family, their schoolmates, their friends. Uh, It it obviously requires enormous courage uh, to do that, and maybe the significance of what they're doing goes well beyond the actual words, because it is an indication of consciousness, and if these things really happened, then let the truth be told, and it's important that it be known. What were some of the hardest moments during the years? Again, I know I'm going backwards now, but were you called a traitor? Well, we all, maybe our audiences don't know actually what happened to you, and you can talk about it if you want, but what were the hardest moments in terms of how your own society treated you for your resistance and uh, you know struggle against apartheid? Uh, I would say it was easier for us, much easier for us, in the sense that we knew that we had huge majority support in the community, but also even around us. 
there, there were little buffers. It might be a doctor who wouldn't get politically involved but would provide medical treatment based on the fact, Alba, you've been unfairly, unjustly treated, locked up without trial, deprived of sleep and so on. What can I do to help you? It could be lawyers picking up the case. And so even in the white community, there were enough people close to me. I have a, a cousin, Ben Rabinovitz, his wife Shirley. They would give me a meal. I think it was Thursday nights. I would go to their house, just have a lovely, lovely nosh. We didn't talk politics, but it was just a sign of it was compassion and saying, Albie, we won't do what you're doing, but we admire you. Mm. So I think the refuseniks in Israel, in that sense, are much more isolated, much more alone, and in that sense require much greater courage than, than my generation did. But you also write in the book about um, a moment where you say the most difficult time was not actually the moment of the bomb or the rehabilitation, but going back to a period in detention when you were humiliated and they were trying to make you talk. Why was that the most difficult time of this entire struggle, given what you've been through? The, the worst moment in my life by far was the moment when, through sleep deprivation, I felt myself cracking, collapsing on the floor. Water poured on me, my eyes prized open, put back on the seat, happening repeatedly and feeling myself break. And that was a humiliation of my soul, an indication of the strength that they had. Uh, I resisted as much as I could within that framework and was saved from future humiliation by, in fact, a court case that was being brought outside that prevented the process from continuing. The bomb attack on me, which I lost my right arm and sight of an eye, in a very strange way, had completely the opposite effect that's the moment every freedom fighter is waiting for. Will they come for me? Will they come today? Will I be brave? Will I get through? They come for me. They tried to kill me. And I'd survived. I felt fantastic. And I, I felt almost a sense of, of triumph. And it was though surviving the bomb blew away the sadness and the misery of the breakdown under interrogation. Just because this is such an emotional theme, I'm brought back to another very emotional part of the book where you talk about meeting the person who planned this bomb. Can you describe that meeting a little bit and what you eventually took away from it? Yes. Now now I'm Judge Albie Sachs uh, in my chambers. You people How many have, years later? You, you people have offices. We judges had chambers. This is now, let's see, the bomb was 88, and this would have been about 66, so you, you can do the mathematics. 96. Uh, 96, yes. 96. Mm. So it's, what, a dozen years later? Well, 88 to 96, so actually eight years later, yeah. I thought it was even... Or did you mean 2006? I thought it was more. No, 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 mm. it was 90, okay. So it was even closer. Mm -hmm. And I'm told the phone rings and a voice says, at reception, there's a man, says he has an appointment to see you, and I said, send him through and my heart is going boom 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 because he had phoned to say he had organized the bomb in my car he's going to the truth commission am i willing to see him and i walk to the security gate i open it and i see this guy younger than me he's tall and thin like me and he's looking at me as if to say so this is the man i tried to kill and i'm looking at him this is the man who tried to kill me we hadn't fought over anything, over love, passion, job, money. But he was on that side, I was on this side. In the event, we go to my chambers. He's striding like a soldier, and I try my best judge's slow ambulation to control even that little march. And we sit down, we talk. We talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, and... In the end, I say, Henry, I've only got your face. I said, Henry, normally when I say goodbye to someone, I shake that person's hand. I can't shake your hand. But go to the Truth Commission, tell them what you know, and maybe who knows what will happen. And when he walked back, I noticed now he's not like a proud soldier. He's slouching along. 
and I forget about him. And we work very, very, very hard as judges. And the end of the year, that same year, it was summer, it was hot. I go with a friend to a party. The band is playing. The music is loud. And I hear a voice saying, Albie, Albie, it's Henry. Henry van der Westhuizen, the guy who'd come to speak to me. And we get into a corner and I say what happened and he's very excited. He's beaming, he tells me, and I spoke to Bobby and Sue and Farouk using the names of people who'd been in exile with me, also could have been victims of the bomb. I told them everything and you said that maybe, and I said, Henry, I've only got your face to tell me that what you're saying is the truth. And I shook his hand. He went away elated. I almost fainted. But I heard afterwards that he suddenly left the party, went home and he cried for two weeks. I don't know if that's true, but I like to believe it's true. I'm not even pursuing the story because I want to believe it's true. For me, that's more important. I got, I remember when I was recovering in the London hospital, the Mozambican doctors saved my life. They, they were wonderful. I was flown to London, first class for the first time in my life, but I'm unconscious. I can't even enjoy it. And I get a letter one day and says, don't worry, Comrade LB, we will avenge you. And I think, signed Bobby, that same Bobby who'd been in exile with me. And I think, we want to cut off the arms. We want to blind in one eye. Is that the country we're fighting for? If we get freedom, if we get democracy, if we get the rule of law, that will be my soft vengeance. Roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. And that theme of soft vengeance then became, if you like, the theme of my life. The soft vengeance was helping to write our new constitution that forbade detention without trial, eliminated torture, all the violence of the past, that forbade the racism of the past, and that also built in protections against abuse of power by new people in power in, in, in those days. My soft vengeance was sitting on the court that was now applying the fundamental rights and values of our new constitution and participating in social programs, enforcing social and economic rights, in signing on to judgments, granting rights for women who'd been held down by patriarchy in all our cultures and aspects of our society in the mm -hmm. past. That became the soft vengeance mm -hmm. in my life. Thank you. I'll, I'll end with a question that, um, you know, I don't know if we can really directly relate so much about the South African case to Israel and the Palestinians. If you have any particular insight, I'm happy to hear it. But what I thought I would ask instead is, I can't help but observe while I've been here how many people who are Jewish were involved in this struggle. And I know you wrote that your family was very secular and maybe even atheist, but certainly connected to the Communist Party. Um, what do you think? Is there a Jewish heritage or legacy or something about the Jewish culture that motivated so many people to be part of the anti-apartheid struggle here? And what does that say about the Jews of Israel and where they might be on the situation with the Israelis and Palestinians right now? When I got back from 24 years of exile, I was invited by a group of Jews who had taken part in the mass demonstrations, Jews for Social Justice, to go up to the University of Cape Town to look at the Kaplan Center, the exhibition they had there. And I said, fine, they'd been in the struggle. And I looked and I looked for my dad, Solly Sachs, Garment Workers Union, he wasn't there. I looked for Sam Khan, the brilliant attorney had taught me the real craft of fighting difficult political legal cases. He wasn't there. I thought of so many Jews who'd been active in the struggle. My friend Dennis Goldberg spent 22 years on Robben Island. He wasn't there. So I said, why don't you have an exhibition that brings out the number of Jews who did take part in the struggle so that Jews can be proud of those who did resist apartheid and who didn't say, don't rock the boat, or don't make life difficult. Well, it took us about five years to get that exhibition going. And it was my colleague, Justice Richard Goldstone, who launched the book at the Jewish Museum uh, in Cape Town uh, next to a very, very beautiful Holocaust Museum section. 
And he said, I launched this book with shame and with pride. And the shame is the fact that so few Jews took part in the struggle against apartheid and that the official Jewish community didn't denounce apartheid and often went along with it. But pride in the fact that amongst the whites who did participate in the struggle, so many were Jews. And I think he got the balance maybe pretty correct. And it wasn't directly through the Jewish religion as such. The only book that I was allowed when I was in solitary confinement was the Bible, uh, Old Testament, New Testament. And when I read the Old Testament, now I'm reading it for the first time, so I wasn't a Torah student at, at all. And I'm looking for consolation. I'm looking for hope, for comfort. And I find most of it is smiting. We are smiting our enemies. We are beleaguered. And we smiting them down to the last chicken and dog. And then I come to the Song of Songs and the Solomon period. And it's not only beautiful, but Solomon is reaching out to the world, embracing the world, not isolationist. And there are elements of love and a worldliness and internationalism that's very appealing. And then we go back to the smiting, and then it comes to the prophets, and then it's there, especially in Isaiah, uh, but especially in Isaiah. And that millenarian vision of a just society, not just for Jews, but just for humanity, just for everybody, I could identify strongly with that. Now, maybe those themes came through, through my parents who were escaping the pogroms in uh, Lithuania, through the revulsion and, and anger at the genocide, the knowledge that so many of my family perished in that period. Maybe these were background circumstances that made it easier for my generation of young South Africans to participate in the freedom struggle in South Africa. So if I have to identify in that sense, and I, I do identify strongly, I am a Jew, it's part of me, it's part of my background, my culture, but the Judaism that appeals to me is, if you like, the Judaism of Einstein and Karl Marx and Freud, uh, that vision of reaching out to the world, of not being trapped in one particular time and space, of an intense love for humanity. I think those are themes that speak very, very strongly to me. Very interesting. And I think this also brings us back to the universal principles of constitutionalism that you write about also in the book. Albie Sachs, thank you so much. That's Albie Sachs. He is formerly a judge on the first constitutional court in democratic South Africa, the author of the book we've been discussing today, We the People, Insights of an Activist Judge. Albie, thank you for being on the show. Thanks once again to the Van Leer Institute and the Israel Institute for their generous support. If you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. Just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcasts and take your pick or listen to all of them. Thanks also to Guzim Ozdemir and Itai Shalem, our sound engineers. You must also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, both me and Gilad. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. I'm Dalia Shenlin. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.